Hello and welcome to another episode of our series on India's wars since its independence. And in this episode, we will explain how India initiated the military coup de grace with the liberation of Dhaka. In the previous episode, we have talked about what led to India's military engagement that turned out to be a war that Indians will forever remember and Pakistanis would like to forget. Nineteen seventy one was a remarkable year. There was a great uprising in East Pakistan, and the Pakistan army suddenly, with its clampdown of the local population, was beginning to get cornered by the local Bengali population with their guerrilla forces like the Shak Chanti Bahini, the Mukti Bahini, and various other forces who when they got an opportunity, were ambushing Pakistani army, vehicles and military installations. Training for these military activities was provided to the guerrilla forces of East Pakistan by India's army. Many officers who had commando expertise were brought in from the commando school to give them guidance. Senior military commanders taught them how to use basic military equipment and India basically provided them all the support and resources necessary to launch attacks on Pakistan and its forces and keep them unsettled. There was also a government of Bangladesh that was established in waiting in Kolkata, that time Calcutta. And they were clearly engaging extensively with Indian Army's Headquarter Eastern Command, which uh, had General Arora as the army commander and the very, very capable General JFR Jacob as the chief of staff. So all sorts of information, training, maps and whatever assistance was being provided to them. But India also readied plans for the first time to use all the three services in what classically became an inter-service operation. So the Army, Navy, Air Force put together their own plans and then engaged with each other to coordinate the plans. The Navy had an extremely uh, brave and uh, capable Naval Chief, Admiral S.M. Nanda, who put together the plans for the Navy's massive attacks on Karachi Harbour, which as we know, that took place on the 4th of December and completely unsettled Pakistan and made West Pakistan's Navy virtually non-functional. On the Eastern Front, he moved the Indian aircraft carrier INS Vikrant quite secretly to blockade the coast of East Pakistan. Now, the Pakistanis were in a bit of a fix because they exactly didn't know where the aircraft carrier group was placed. What was done was the aircraft carrier group was placed on one of the islands of Andamans and Nicobar. So Pakistan was looking for them in the high seas but couldn't. And then the Air Force started this massive air campaign across East Pakistan. Soon, within a few days, Pakistan's Air Force was barely struggling to keep itself together in East Pakistan. Whereas on India's Western Front, the Air Force of Pakistan was very active. And was in place after they had initiated the war formally on the night of 3rd, 4th December by attacking a number of Indian military and civilian airfields from Jammu to Pathankot to Agra, Jodhpur, elsewhere. So clearly war had been declared. But historical accounts now tell us that the war actually started on the night of 21st, 22nd November when Indian troops that had been going in into East Pakistan, giving a scare to the Pakistan army and pulling back before that, finally got into massive battle with Pakistani troops on the borders of East Pakistan. Two famous battles being the Battle of Hili, where eight guards won three Mahavi Chakras, and then the battles around Silet, the battles against Pakistani troops in various other military garrison townships. But what happened 
was that India noticed that Pakistan had built up formidable defences along the borders and therefore Pakistan was doing everything to stop India's attack on these major communication centres or border townships. Indian commanders, the most dramatically capable of them was General Sagat Singh who decided that the smarter thing to do is to keep the townships where Pakistani troops were engaged and bypass them and head for Dhaka. This is something that Pakistanis have admitted to me themselves that they never expected. And in later days, it showed the sheer vision of our military commanders that put completely Pakistan on the back foot. Because the orders to the entire Eastern Command from Delhi were that just liberate large patches of area in Khulna and near Chittagong so that Pakistani, East Pakistani refugees can be pushed back and India could create a POK kind of situation in East Pakistan. But the army had other plans and good thing for the army that Mrs. Gandhi, having learned the lessons from her father and his cronies deep involvement in the 1962 conflict which led to the humiliation and the disaster during the Chinese invasion. In this case, she kept out. The deal with General Manik Shah, Air Chief Marshal P.C. Lahal and Admiral Nanda was you guys look after the military campaign, I will look after world opinion and diplomatic support. And she did that very well. Finally, on the Western Front, Pakistan got a few shocks. One of them was a large military column that moved towards Longewala near Jaisalmer at the aim of capturing Jaisalmer and possibly even areas around Jodhpur. India had a small BOP detachment which was reinforced by a company of the Punjab Regiment led by Major Kuldeep Singh Chandpuri. Chandpuri carried out one of the finest acts of defence against a large force. He had just 110 odd men. And he held back on that dramatic night of Pakistani attacks at least, at least 3,500 men armed with tanks, armoured vehicles and artillery. Chandpuri did not give in. He held on and in the early hours of the morning, the Indian Air Force from Jaisalmer went over the heads of all those Pakistani tanks that had been roaming around trying to find a way past Longewala onto Jaisalmer and bombed the hell out of them. Today, there is a graveyard of Pakistani tanks ahead of Longewala on the border where the Air Force knocked out scores and dozens of Pakistani tanks. There was another Pakistani effort to try and get into the Indian airspace in Srinagar where Nirmaljit Singh Sekhon carried out superb air warrior tactics and knocked out at least four Pakistani sabre jets, if not more, earning for himself a Paramir Chakra. But the most dramatic actions were on the bombing of the Karachi coast and the movement of Indian troops across the Meghna River, where General Sagat Singh employed for the first time airborne lifting of infantry troops through helicopters and Air Marshal, then Group Captain Chandan Singh, played a dramatic role in that. As well as a parachute drop took place just outside Dhaka called the Tangail Drop. And two paras that executed that drop, the psychological impact of that on Pakistanis in Dhaka was enormous. That drop led to Pakistanis being told an Indian para brigade has landed. That battalion, two paras, was part of the 50 independent para brigade, but it wasn't the whole brigade because India did not have the full airlift capabilities to launch a brigade. So the brigade had landed in, in the minds of the Pakistanis, but it was paratroopers. Soon, General Jacob got a call from Sam Manikshaw. He says, Jake, go and get a surrender. So he says, sir, fine. He took a helicopter and flew to Dhaka to push Pakistanis for a surrender. When he landed up in Dhaka, he had his swagger stick in one hand and his pipe in the other, no weapon on him. And he was thinking to himself, what happens if these guys arrest me? He says, anyway, I'm a bachelor, so I can live with it. He went, met Niazi and others who were rejoicing and having a great lunch with glasses of beer in the officer's mess in Dhaka, thinking any time the surrender would be evaded because the UN will ask for a ceasefire. 
Bhutto kept reassuring Yahya Khan from New York to say, I am talking to the UN, but now accounts show us that Bhutto was doing nothing like that. Bhutto wanted this military campaign to end in India's favor so that the Pakistan army would get off its high horse and go back to the barracks. And soon, in one conversation, Yahya Khan kept yelling to him, when are they asking for the ceasefire? He says, I can't hear you, General. Again, he yelled back. He said, I can't hear you, General. Then the operator pitched in in between. In those days, ladies and gentlemen, telephone communications were poor all over the world, at least from our part of the world to get to the West. So the operator said to Bhutto, he said, Mr. Bhutto, I can hear what he's saying. Should I tell you what he's saying? He says, you keep out of it. So Bhutto was carrying out the charade. Finally, General Jacob told General Yahya that, sir, I've come to seek a surrender. He says, get lost. Have a glass of beer and get lost because no surrender. We are going to get a UN ceasefire. You guys will go back to the start point of the campaign. Bhutto had been assuring them of a surrender. Yahya and others believed it. And they were hoping the Chinese would also intervene in their favor. But the war, as we know, took place in end November. And after end November, the passes get sealed on the high Himalayas. The Chinese were no way going to be able to put troops on India. They had to be on the other side of the Himalayas. So, Yahya had told General Niazi, who was then commander of East Pakistan's forces, that stick it out. Jacob tells him, he says, sir, I give you three chances to get a surrender and see that the orders are passed to your troops. Otherwise, we'll have no choice but to order the butchering of Pakistani troops. And finally, on his third option to Yahya, sorry, on his third uh, call to General Niazi, Niazi put his head down and started weeping. He says, I accept the surrender, but I won't command the parade. Jacob said, no problem, your ADC will command the parade. But tomorrow morning, 0900 at the Dhaka race ground, and we will take your formal surrender in front of the whole world. Jacob went back to Calcutta, told Manik Shah. Manik Shah went and told Mrs. Gandhi. Mrs. Gandhi was not expecting such a quick surrender and such a great victory. So she ran up the steps of parliament and announced that Dhaka has fallen to Indian troops. Rest as they say is history, but the next day, the whole lot of them, General Arora, General Sagat Singh, Air Marshal Diwan, executing the air campaign, Admiral Krishnan, executing the naval blockade of East Pakistan, all landed up in Dhaka, and in, on two rickety tables quickly assembled in the Dhaka parade ground, the surrender document was signed by Jajit Arora and A.A.K. Niazi, both Lieutenant Generals, interestingly, both being batchmates from the Indian Military Academy of Dehradun. Niazi pleaded that he told Arora, I'm only signing this under the condition that you'll give me military cover and take me out of here because the crowds are ready to lynch us. This is the first time after a military surrender, the surrendered troops were allowed to keep their weapons from being lynched by the Dhaka and the Bangladeshi population who had been beaten up, who had been molested, who had been raped by the Pakistan army. The most shameful conduct by any army in the history of warfare. And so, finally, India sat with 93,000 prisoners on its lap, a bonanza that nobody had expected. Thereafter, in Shimla in 1972, Mrs. Gandhi met Zulfikar Bhutto for the peace talks and the Shimla Accord. However, Bhutto being conniving as he is, misled Mrs. Gandhi into believing that he will settle the Kashmir issue permanently. The ceasefire line along Jammu Kashmir was converted to the line of control, more a political military line, but at the end of the day, a full division of Kashmir never took place. Perhaps for the better now, because India now claims all of Kashmir all over again. And Bhutto took back the 93,000 plus prisoners of war that Pakistanis claim were only 25 to 28,000 military men. The rest were civilian employees of the military cantonment. But the fact of the matter, the number is 93,000 plus. They went back to Pakistan. Interestingly, the inquiry that took place after that was led by a guy called Hamidur Rahman. And when he asked General Niazi, when you had more troops than India could put together around Dhaka, India could only put together about 3,000 troops around Dhaka, where you had 27,000 around troops, why did you surrender? 
So Niazi, who was a chain smoker, he looked at him, he says, because Jacob bluffed me. So that is the recorded history of the 1971 war. India had a victory that its diplomats and bureaucrats sadly squandered by giving Pakistan a decent exit out of the conflict. And Pakistan now claims this was an Indian bluff. They would have done better if they were allowed to fight a longer war against India. Nixon had promised them that he would put nuclear weapons on India if India tries to break up West Pakistan. And he sent the aircraft carrier group, the 7th Fleet with the USS Enterprise into the Bay of Bengal, which was a nuclear powered carrier with nuclear weapons. That, and Nixon had written that in one of his memoirs, that he seriously thought of bombing India. But the ceasefire saved West Pakistan as we know today what is Pakistan. And East Pakistan led to the creation of Bangladesh.